Hello viewers, I am your host Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with Bangladesh Foreign Minister Mohammad Hassan Mahmood's India visit, which holds significant importance in the context of New Delhi-Dhaka relations. On his three-day visit to India, Mahmood held a comprehensive and productive meeting with his counterpart S.J. Shankar and reviewed the progress of bilateral relations in wide range of areas including cross-border connectivity and economic and development partnership. A report. The newly appointed Foreign Minister of Bangladesh, Dr. Hassan Mahmood, visited India for three days from February 7. Mahmood's visit was significant as it marked the first foreign visit of the newly sworn in Bangladesh government following Sheikh Hasina's historic win for the consecutive fourth term as the Prime Minister. During the visit, Mahmood held talks with India's External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar and reviewed the progress of bilateral relations in a wide range of areas, including cross-border connectivity, economic and development partnership, cooperation in defence and security, power, energy, water resources and people-to-people -people exchanges. Mahmood also held a meeting with National Security Advisor Ajit Doval and visited Rajgarh. The visit demonstrated the high importance and priority that both New Delhi and Dhaka attached to their bilateral relationship. Both the countries shared border with Myanmar. We discussed the issue with the National Security Advisor because for the regional peace and stability, this is important that peace prevails in Myanmar. So we discussed the issue. The two leaders of India and Bangladesh discussed regional and sub-regional issues of common interest. Earlier this month, Jay Shankar met Mahmood on the sidelines of the Non-Aligned Movement Summit in Uganda, where the two discussed strengthening the ties between India and Bangladesh. We are two brotherly countries and we have excellent ties between the two countries. So any visit of Bangladesh minister our Indian Minister to Bangladesh definitely uh, strengthen our ties. So how important, how, uh, uh, how do you see the visit, that is up to you, in fact. But we value the visit because I've come here by the invitation of the Foreign Minister of India. So uh, we are thankful to Indian government and especially to the Foreign Minister for inviting me here. Definitely this visit will contribute to the relationship. Yeah. India and Bangladesh have maintained steady diplomatic relations over the years. New Delhi's link with Dhaka are cultural, social and economic. India helped Bangladesh in the country's 1971 liberation war against Pakistan. For India, Sheikh Hasina has proved to be a reliable ally, as under Hasina's leadership, New Delhi's security establishment has received cooperation from Bangladeshi agencies. Hasina has spent six years of her life in exile in India, following the assassination of her father, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. She resided in Delhi with her children under an assumed identity. Therefore, during the election in Bangladesh, Hasina did not just acknowledge India's role in her nation's freedom, but also thanked the country for keeping her safe at a time when she was going through one of the most difficult stages of her life. Let's now move to debt-stricken Sri Lanka, which has signed a free trade pact with Thailand. Sri Lanka hopes this move can help it emerge from its worst financial crisis in decades. The island nation defaulted on its overseas debt in May 2022 after the severe shortage of foreign exchange reserves triggered the worst financial crisis since independence from Britain in 1948. The crisis, which was started due to several compounding factors, have left a large population of Sri Lanka vulnerable. Take a look. Sri Lanka and Thailand signed a free trade agreement on February 3rd, a move Colombo hopes will help it emerge from its worst financial crisis in decades. The island nation has been renewing a focus on trade deals to foster economic growth and help its battered economy, which is estimated by the World Bank to have contracted 3.8% last year. After a severe foreign exchange crunch, plunged it to a wider financial crisis. 
The free trade agreement is aimed at enhancing market opportunities with negotiations covering various aspects such as trade in goods, investment, customs procedure and intellectual property rights. The main focus of this visit is accelerating economic cooperation between Sri Lanka and Thailand. There is significant potential for the expansion of trade and investment ties between our two countries which have remained largely untapped. The Prime Minister and I witnessed the signing of the Sri Lanka-Thailand free trade agreement a short while ago. Given the enormous potential between our two countries, I believe that the signing of the free trade agreement today will significantly boost bilateral trade and investments in the years ahead. Sri Lanka defaulted on its overseas debt in May 2022 after a severe shortage of foreign exchange reserves triggered the worst financial crisis since independence from Britain in 1948. The country's foreign minister, Ali Sabri, has said that Colombo expects it to attract about 5 billion US dollars in foreign funds in the next two years, once it is able to finalize the restructuring of its overseas debt. All put together, we are, we are looking at within the next 12 to 24 months, somewhere in the region of about 5 billion worth of foreign currency in uh, infusion into the country in terms of projects and all those things and also from the sale of uh, some of the state-owned enterprises. Sri Lanka has made progress on about 11 billion US dollars of bilateral debt restructuring and hopes to have agreements in place with all key creditors, including bondholders, by May. It will then focus on kick-starting major infrastructure projects suspended during the crisis, including an expansion of the main airport near Colombo and a two billion US dollars light railway project with Japan. The crisis, which was started due to several compounding factors, have left a large population of Sri Lanka multidimensionally vulnerable. In November last year, Sri Lanka's Supreme Court ruled on the country's worst economic crisis since independence. The court ruled that former President Gotabaya Rajapaksa and his brother, former Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa and several other government officials were guilty of mishandling the economy. The top court held that the respondents violated the public trust and fundamental rights of the petitioners. The common people in the island nation had called the court's ruling a right decision, but they had expressed their desire to see more actions against the culprits. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Organization activity at Morigasaki Water Reclamation Center in Ota District, Tokyo. The latest solar power generation perovskite solar cell unit is set up as a demonstration experiment. Perovskite solar cell is a Japanese original technology and about 30% of the world's production of iodine, the main material, is produced in Japan. こちらはあの、これまでの従来型のシリコン太陽電池と比較しまして、非常に薄くて軽いという特徴を持っています。さらに加えてですね、曲げることもできるような電池になっておりまして、あの、様々な場所へ設置ができるといった、ま、機体が
in Malaysia. Ini sepatutnya tak berlaku dalam sebuah negara Islam. Tapi perkara ini berlaku depan mata kita sendiri. Jadi kita sebagai seorang Islam tak berasa cicabar dengan benda-benda yang berlaku macam ni. Kalau luar negara kita tidak ada undang-undang, sudah hancur dah. Baik tabiat pagi ini dah hancur dah. Peranan daripada, kepada pemerintah yang sepatutnya lebih besar lagi peranan untuk mempertahankan kesucian agama Islam daripada dinodai. Kerana apabila ada diskriminasi, kengkangan dan sebagainya, bermakna agama Islam tidak dapat dilaksanakan dengan sebaik mungkin. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi recently addressed India Energy Week 2024 and held a roundtable with global oil and gas CEOs and experts. The industry leaders expressed their views on the progressive environment that India has created in the energy sector over the last decade. PM Modi declared that a large part of India's capital expenditure in the next financial year will be spent on energy security. Several pacts and agreements were signed at the event. Our report. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated and addressed the India Energy Week 2024 in Goa on February 6. The four-day event was India's largest and only all-encompassing energy exhibition and conference. The program was attended by several well-known dignitaries from the energy industry. PM interacted with the top energy sector CEOs and highlighted the wide range of opportunities the country is offering in the sector. He said that a large part of India's capital expenditure in the next financial year will be spent on energy security. PM added that India plans to invest a significant portion of its 133.90 billion US dollar budget for infrastructure toward the energy sector. Abhi ek sapta pehle jo Bharat ka budget aaya hai usme humne ab infrastructure par 11 lakh crore rupees se adhik ke kharch ka sankalp liya hai. Iska ek bada hissa energy sector ke khate mein jana tay hai. PM Modi held a round table with global oil and gas CEOs and experts. The industry leader expressed their view on the progressive environment that India has created in the energy sector over the last decade. There is no doubt around the world India's growth has been propelled by the strong visionary leadership of His Excellency Prime Minister Modi. India has become a world-class top player on all fronts, politics, energy, economics, fight against climate change, eradication of poverty. These are all key themes that the Prime Minister has managed with his visionary and firm leadership to achieve and instill into India. We believe the future will be even greater for India. We look forward to continuing our collaboration with India. And India's approach in ensuring an inclusive uh, strategy to address affordability, availability and access, as highlighted by uh, Sri Modi earlier, is only going to hold it in good stead to remain a competitive and vibrant economy long to the future. At the event, PM Modi inaugurated the ONGC Sea Survival Center, a pioneering integrated sea survival training center designed to elevate India's sea survival training standards to global level. Several pacts and agreements were signed at the event. Petronid LNG Limited, India's biggest liquefied natural gas import, signed a pact with Qatar Energy to extend the deal to buy 7.5 million tons a year of gas for producing electricity making fertilizer and converting to CNG. Moreover, ONGC and NTPC Green Energy Limited signed a joint venture agreement to focus on the offshore wind energy projects. The event was successfully concluded on February 9. India Energy Week 2024 brought together the entire energy value chain while serving as a catalyst for India energy transition goals. Let's now move to Pakistan, where in an attempt to cover up their heinous acts of extrajudicial killings, police are allegedly asking families of Baloch persons killed in the fake encounters to sign a form in order to receive their bodies. The illegal form state that the killed persons were Baloch Liberation Army militants. Several families are refusing to sign the forms, rejecting false accusations against their loved ones. A report. 
Pakistani forces and agencies are probably not satisfied with the genocide of the Baloch people. That is why they have adopted new strategy to torture the innocent residents of the most underdeveloped province. In an attempt to cover their heinous acts of extrajudicial killings, the police in the Islamic Republic are allegedly asking families of Baloch persons who have been killed in the fake encounters to sign a form in order to receive their bodies. The illegal forms state that the killed persons were Baloch Liberation Army militants. Several families are refusing to sign the forms, rejecting false accusations against their loved ones. Prominent Baloch activists, including Dr. Maharang Baloch, are raising their voice against the inhuman attitude. Where thousands of Baloch are unfortunately disappeared, and while thousands have been killed by the state of Pakistan, and you keep your silence, you have kept your silence against this genocidal policies. Look at those people. These all are the victims of Pakistani state atrocities. They are all wanting to act on upon your human rights. If there is a humanity left in, in this event, then you must come and intervene. You must ask the terrorist state of Pakistan that how they are exploiting Baloch resources, how they are killing the innocent Baloch people. Thousands of Baloch over the last two decades have been the victims of extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances. In different locations of Balochistan, certain protests are going on against the extrajudicial killings. Baloch Yegjati Committee, a rights group that campaigns against enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings of the Baloch people, is running a social campaign against the fake encounters of forcibly disappeared persons. Recently, the committee held a press conference in front of civil hospital in Quetta against the fake encounters of missing persons, where the family members of the victims were also present. Dr. Maharang Baloch addressed the media regarding the extrajudicial killings. In her address, Maharang highlighted that the Pakistani authorities completely denied to listen to the peaceful demand of the Long March and want to continue their cruel and oppressive policies towards Balochistan. Balochistan ki har shehar aur gaon se hazaron logon ne riyasati zulm aur jabar ke khilaf sadkon ka rukh karte hue riyasat ke in zalimana policies ke khilaf sakht narazgi ka izhar kiya. Lekin Baloch awami raddiyamal ke bawajood रियासत बलूचिस्तान में अपनी पॉलिसियों में किसी भी तरह की तब्दीली लाने के लिए तैयार नहीं है लॉन्ग मार्च में सैकड़ों लापता अफराद के लवाइकी ने इस उम्मीद और भरोसे से मार्च में हिस्सा लिया ताकि इनके प्यारों को फेक इनकाउंटर में कत्ल ना किया जाए लेकिन बदकिस्मती से रियासत बलूचिस्तान के हवाले से अपने जालमाना और जाबराना पॉलिसियों को जारी रखने की ख्वाहिश रखती है आलिया मच वाक्य के बाद जिस तरह जिंदान से लापता अफराद को निकाल कर कतल किया गया ये जुल्म और जबर की इंतिया है Baloch activists are signing a petition urging the international authorities to take action on the ongoing genocide of their community members. They are demanding the United Nations and human rights organizations to take action and hold the authorities accountable for the crimes committed in Balochistan. Activists want a fact-finding mission headed by the United Nations Working Group to investigate the matter. In the Pakistan's most underdeveloped areas of Balochistan, the country's intelligence agency, Inter-Services Intelligence, has been accused of committing all kinds of atrocities, including abduction, killing and torture to instill fear. Injustice and strong feeling of alienation have forced some Baloch people to pick up arms who are continuously targeting the Pakistani army personnel and Chinese assets in their region. Pakistan's dirty tear tactics in Balochistan can't work for long. If not today, then tomorrow, the Islamabad dispensation will have to bow before the people. 
And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.